I, I come from the land of Kerala where Adi Shankara almost 1000 plus years back you know, that young boy came to various parts of India had that Vedanta he was at the core Vedanta the core Vedantic scholar established myths so even Indian nation right now if you see there is a broader uh, broader glue that uh, holds us together and now coming to the younger generations because many of you might be knowing Acharya Prashant is a very sought out uh, person by the younger generation to who would like to listen so wh what is the Vedantic concept of human relationship how do you connect to each other is it basically uh, we are all alone or should we seek company how, what would be the relationship healthy relationship input to them based on Vedanta? see company that brings you to aloneness you see we are born unfulfilled we are born lonely you look at the newborn child and you will realize we are constantly seeking something all the time he is stretching out his hands and his limbs he does not know of things but is staring at them observing that's what even the newborn is doing so company is something we always seek. The question is, what is the quality of the company we keep? So Vedant advises you to know your fundamental reality. And your fundamental reality is that you are an unfulfilled ego. You are an unfulfilled self, all of us. And since we are unfulfilled, it is in our best interest to seek company that would fulfill us in the real sense. And what does I mean by real sense there is company that merely ingratiates you merely pleases you for a while now there is a difference between being pleased and being fulfilled hmm? so be very discreet in the company that you seek see whether the people you are with the circumstances you are in the books you are reading the stuff you are observing is that offering you just momentary pleasure or is it leading you towards something that is more timeless that is the company you have to seek so as i said right in the beginning be with people who will ultimately enable you to be alone and to be alone does not mean abhorring company to be alone means seeking company or being in company from a point of strength i'm with you but not dependent on you so i can share with you i can be joyful with you I need not be violently dependent on you. Hmm? That's the right company. I believe that's a great insight and input for every youngster. Because being alone and being lonely are different. And only when you have, as he rightly says, only when you have that quality of uh, strongly being alone, you can even initiate good companies. Otherwise, it will be mere yes, attachments. Yes, yes, yes. Can you just uh, elaborate on that difference between attachment? Because in many a times in the book, you have elaborated that. Right. Healthy relationship and mere attachments. Right, right. See, when you are attached, then you are using the other really to remain who you are. Hmm? The intention is fundamentally different. I'm attached to something because it serves the purposes of my current self. But my current self is anyway of very little use to me. So attachment pleases me, pleases all of us, but does us no real good. Now love is fundamentally different. To be in love is to be attracted towards something or somebody or some point that would dissolve all that within you that makes you suffer. Hmm? I have a lot within me that is at the root of my suffering. Now, can I be attracted to the end of this suffering? This is called love. Equally, I could behave in a self-defeating way and be attracted towards something that continues to protect and secure my weaknesses. Hmm? And when my weaknesses are secured, I feel all right because who am I? My weaknesses is who am I? And I want to live, I want to continue. In other words, my weaknesses want to continue through me. And my weaknesses in their urge for security and continuation find expression through my attachments. I'm attached to something. If I'm attached to something, it serves my purposes. It does not liberate me. And also, this was from my perspective, but if I'm attached to somebody, then I'll not let that person go. Attachment is the opposite of freedom. In attachment, neither do I want my freedom, nor will I allow the other to be free. So attachment really is poisonous and attachment is not at all love. Love is beautiful, love is sublime, love is pro-life, attachment is poisonous, anti-life. 
mutually destructive relationship are many a, are many a times the norms of a younger generation so yeah. you now when i got this opportunity of interacting with you i was asking around the people what would be the question you would like to ask him so you know there were many questions that i noted down one of the interesting question that came was what is the vedantic view of wealth you know he said something like you know we have always heard spirituality you should leave your family you should leave everything go to himalayas yeah. so what would be the vedantic view of wealth and wealth accumulation see see as as you raise these things up uh, rahul it pleases me so much because there are so many verses that very directly address these uh, questions hmm? uh, aloneness heaven hell now wealth vedant is very very clear before you talk of anything remember who you are hmm? so if i am someone who keeps feeling poor within then what is the right definition of wealth for me right definition of wealth is not something this poor man can accumulate right definition of wealth is something that will not allow this poor man to feel poor anymore and these are two very different things in spite of holding a lot of riches i can still continue to feel poor and the proof of that will be that i'll still want more i still want more i feel poor i still want more i feel poor huh? instead can i have something that will enable me to no more feel poor that is wealth that is wealth i think that's one of the most wonderful description of what wealth is and it was uh, ringing you know many things my yeah this is right i have heard and you know uh, when you go to a career many people choose a opt a career so uh, understanding vedas understanding in depth wisdom might not be their you know first intention because they have to have a livelihood and all so how do you imbibe the spirit of vedanta in our personal life along with all the other things we have we have family we have jobs we run around so what is the practical vedanta aspect a normal person like us uh, like me or like people you know what would be your input to us before you look at anything out there hmm? try looking at the one in here hmm. the one in here is the one for whom everything out there exists so does it not make sense to be in touch with the one in here i really believe that from a very young age vedantic principles should be introduced to today's young minds and this can be very smoothly easily and rightly done even along with our secular obligations vedant is not something i repeat sectarian it does not concern itself with just one people the rishis were magnanimous they were blessing the world in general so how can we not introduce vedant to our kids in our schools colleges universities on grounds that it is coming from the sanatan stream this is a very invalid argument and it has done us a lot of harm already you know young people have so many important decisions to make and several of these decisions you know rahul they are very irreversible and they have they have very long term consequences they just chain you almost for your entire life is it not important that before one rushes into those decisions one has a certain wisdom and wisdom does not come free one has to strive for it one has to devote time to it one has to seek it one has to go places you know all those things need to be done if we think that just through our popular wisdom the mohalla wisdom the kind of stuff we see on social media the stories the anecdotes that we hear in our family or environment and the kind of teachings that we have in general media all these things will suffice to enable us to have proper decisions in life it is not going to be so the human condition is very dire we are not born right and we need to be set right and that is an entire process one has to invest himself into it so my request to all those who are in positions where they can influence policy and to those who can influence the life of even one single human being be it their offspring or even their own life you know my request is please go to vedant it might be just too late though 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 even if you are very old there still is time but why wait for so many decades start right now 
And we live in such a fertile soil of Vedant. You know, all the nations around the world are looking at respectfully through the, you know, Veda. India is a land of Vedas. We have Vedas, Tantra, Yoga, so many systems. But unfortunately, we don't soak ourselves in it. We don't realize the value of it. And there comes an important question you raised earlier. Should our governments, beyond any political divide or ideological divide, shouldn't we have such sensitization towards our eternal wisdom in our schools? Because that's the right time. These students will face psychological troubles. They will f face lifeological changes. So many stuffs are there. So is it not right to introduce them in schools and colleges as a part of their spiritual awakening? Obviously. Yeah. And let me make a claim that would sound outrageous to many people. Most of whatever is good in the world has come from Vedanta. I am not saying even India. In the entire world. Hmm? The ancient Greek philosophers, it is well known, they were inspired by Vedanta. Hmm? We know of the Sufis as well. We know how in the last two centuries, Prominent Western thinkers, intellectuals, poets, scientists, politicians have been inspired by Vedant. We also know that how all the reform movements in Hinduism, yes, even if at some stage they became independent streams like Buddhism, like Jainism, like Sikhism, were actually bringing out pure Vedant. So Vedant is the greatest heritage that we have. And it is not merely heritage. It is something that each generation has to rediscover for itself. You cannot just get it from your forefathers and keep on your lap. You, you have to go to it by yourself in your aloneness and find what it has to say to you. It must be introduced in schools. It must be introduced in colleges. And if the formal system refuses to take note of this, then we must have public efforts like ours, huh? we, we have initiated a program uh, called Ghar Ghar Upanishad and we are sending uh, copies of Upanishads free of cost to all those who care to come and register at our website. It's a very small effort. Though we intend to bring this to millions of homes, if uh, the agencies in power can take this up, it will do a lot of good to our nation. And I believe Z, one of the most prominent channels, also took up this mission because that candle can, that candle can light up a million other candles. And you know, especially the mainstream media, the national media, when it gives importance, otherwise we usually spend it in debates and you know, different topics. But you know, Vedic wisdom is so unifying, universal, ap applicable for everyone whole encompassing, such wisdom is there. And right now, since we are coming to the end of the time, one, two or three questions. There are many interpretations that is coming. You know, most of them may be not very authentic. And Acharya Prashant is a person who really knows the text. He uh, takes it from the sources and interprets. So who would be the other, any stalwarts in history, other great Vedantic thinkers we should familiarize ourselves with? Yeah. yeah. To begin with, the sages of the Upanishads. Hmm? Ashtavakra, even though his work is not formally called an Upanishad. And as we move on in history, then I'll come up with a name that might uh, surprise many of you. Gautam Buddha. Gautam Buddha, from where I look at him, was a very sincere, very true and very astute Vedanti. Hmm? Then we proceed from there. Obviously, we come to Acharya Shankar. Hmm? And uh, then obviously we have Madhavacharya, we have Ramanujacharya. And then the one, hmm, I'm, I'm really uh, a student of, a fan of Kabir Sahib. Hmm? So these are the ones uh, one could uh, go back to if one is uh, interested in Vedanta. In recent modern times, it is Ramana Maharshi. Hmm? And Swami Vivekananda, we have already talked of, Ramana Maharshi is extremely pure. And uh, an on the ball, all the time. Of Vedanta himself, an embodiment of Vedanta. An embodiment of Vedanta. Yes, yes. Especially, in, and you know, uh, like Vivekananda once called this rebel child. The Sanadhan Dharma's rebel childs were many. Because of social sit situations, they may have become big, big, different streams. But the root tree is the same, I believe, right? The root tree, right, right. the core Sanadhan Dharma. Rahul, the root of all goodness is Vedanta. I know this is going. To, to ruffle up a few people, but I am, I am re-emphasizing the root of all goodness is Vedanta and 
This, this is something historical and pointing towards the future now I'm saying. The one solution to all problems that mankind is facing today, be it climate change, be it uh, loss of biodiversity, extinction of species, population explosion, intolerance, and then nuclear catastrophes, all the nuclear weapons, the entire arsenal we have accumulated, the one solution is Vedant itself. And if you are not hearing this, and Vivekananda used to say, we need to have a Vedantic brain for the world. That Vedantic brain should be there. Any special Veda, since we are coming to the end of time, any special suktas or any particular uh, thing you would like to point out to them, anything to highlight, any, any, I, I wouldn't even call chance, any particular suktas to remember, yes. so that they can be the guiding principles. Right. See, the ones who would be listening to us are mostly uninitiated people. Yeah. So, I'll probably be ending this with the Shanti part of the Upanishads. The Upanishads have many Shanti parts, out of which the most famous one, and to me, the most meaningful one, is this. You two would have obviously heard of this. Om Purnamada Purnamidam hmm? So, all is full, including this, including that. Fullness comes forth from fullness hmm? and giving expression to fullness the full is still remains full hmm? <laughs> if you want to chant or any any other slokas you would like to invoke because i believe that's such a beautiful thing from fullness it is fullness even if you give that in you know infinite it is still infinitely this and you know perhaps our land is the only land which could uh, expose such wisdom deeper thoughts perhaps the rock bottom of the ocean kind of thoughts and acharya prashant since we are coming to the end of it what would be your concluding remarks to because this this is seen by a cross segment of people there uh, there will be youngsters there will be householders there will be senior people and many people according to your wrong notion they will all think we will have spirituality at the age of 60 you know that was the no, uh, no. that was the wrong old notion we used to follow that we will have we will think about these things you know bode ho jane par you know hum sochenge but you know people like you have always pointed out even from young you should have that flair right one particularly enabling little sutra for everybody. Naham kalas ahmev kalam. Hmm? Naham kalas ahmev kalam. I am not a product of time. I am not a product of circumstances. I am not a product of the union of two mere mortal bodies. Hmm? I am beyond time. I am the essence of time itself. So nothing in time, which means nothing in the world really, let nothing in time I'm going to allow to affect me. Om hmm? Purnamida. We have already said, now I'll we'll take it forward from there. Purnat Purnamudachyate. Hmm? From the full comes forth the full. Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnam Eva Avashishyate. Hmm? Having given rise to the full, having given manifestation to completeness itself, the full is still remains full. Purnam Eva Avashishyate. The Avashesh, the remnant, is, is still totality. So full we are, so complete in our Vedanta has no place for any kind of weakness. Hmm? So it is with this message of strength and completeness and power hmm, that probably now we are coming to end of this. That's, that's wonderful to hear. And like Acharya Prashant, you know, I was just going through some of the great snippets from this book. And this question is the paramount question. Who is the doer? Ask that question to yourself. And in that process of self-discovery, perhaps you discover everything. That's the essence of all our Mahavakyas, whether it is Tattomasi, Ayamadma Brahma, Aham Brahmasmi or Prajnanam Brahma. All the Mahavakyas point out to identify that inner you. And I'm absolutely sure that inner you is illuminated by what Acharya Prasad told, 
uh, listen to him more understand the vedic wisdom use that vedic wisdom for your our nations the entire humanity's development loka samastha suhno bhavantu and it was a pleasure and privilege having uh, this learning from you not even interaction this learning from you acharya prashant thank you thank you sir